Who here's uh, tried to do something with Scala native? Download it, compile a program? Okay, cool, cool, cool. And um, anyone here ever write C uh, for school or for a living? Cool, oh, nice. Okay, I got the right crowd for this. Um, some of this might be uh, a little systems 101 for y'all, but I, this, uh, we'll see where this ends up. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, this is a talk about Scala Native, right? Um, but it's not just a talk about Scala Native. It's a talk about uh, systems programming um, in the, the most traditional sense. It's also a talk about server programming and server programming as the quintessential hard thing to do in systems programming, right? The, the reason there's like one book on Unix systems programming and two more books on writing a decent server. Um, but uh, it's also a talk just about working with emerging technology in general. I mean, here we are, we're at Strange Loop. Um, beyond Scala, there's all kinds of awesome emerging languages out there. Um, and when you're working with new technology, you don't have the kind of giant, stable platform uh, we all take for granted. And absolutely, I, I hope this talk contributes just some, some knowledge about how to, to basically come up with improvised solutions, uh, provisional um, solutions, to do useful work with really new tools. Um, it's also about like, is your OS a platform? What can you expect from your OS? And like, what can you expect from your language? Where's the boundary between those? Um, in, in the more hand wavy later sections. <laughs> um, concretely, the, the talk is gonna be a really quick introduction to Scala Native, probably too quick, but then we're gonna actually like see, some, see a lot of code. This is gonna be a code heavy talk. Um, we're gonna go over like basic like server socket programming, and then we're gonna come up with a minimal viable web server. Um, and then we're gonna start making it faster. We're gonna add some multiplexing, both multiplex protocols with a proxy, and then real direct multiplexed IO. And then we're not gonna conclude, we're just sort of gonna pause trail off and think some warm fuzzy thoughts. All right, so that's the plan um, about me. Um, I'm a consultant at Spantree Technology Group, a fabulous uh, boutique consulting firm in the West Loop of Chicago. Um, I work with Kafka, Akka, and Spark pretty regularly. Um, I've been contributing a bit to the 0.2 and 0.3 uh, releases of Scala Native, um, but I'm by no means like a core uh, dev team member or anything like that. Um, I also work a lot with like Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, Elasticsearch, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, a lot of this content's also available in blog form at spantree.net slash blog. Go check it out. Um, also, um, I'm on Twitter at, at Richard Whalen. I just tweeted out links to uh, the slides and to the GitHub repo with all the code. Um, some of this stuff's a little bleeding edge and might not even be merged in yet, uh, but I'll continue uh, pushing stuff up, up and uh, basically as I blog about it over the coming weeks. Uh, so that being said, let's get started. Um, so what's Scala native? Um, it's, first of all, it's, it's Scala. It's not like a fork or a variant or a separate implementation. It's a, it's a plugin for the Scala compiler and SBT. Um, in particular, it's, a, it's an LLVM-backed um, AOT compiler. Um, so basically what that gives you is the ability to take a Scala program and compile it all the way down to a uh, compact, like maybe five, 10 megabyte, like chunk of executable bytecode, like a C compiler uh, or Go or Rust can, which is, Awesome, um, it's especially awesome for command line tools. Um, people have things like Scala format and there's even some demos of Scala C itself running in Scala native, which is really cool. Um, uh, the downside is you don't have a JVM, <laughs> right? And if you don't have a JVM, doing things with Scala is actually pretty hard just because the original plan of Scala, right, was to bootstrap on all the things the JVM already gave you. And m most pure Scala programs transiently depend on Java classes under the hood to do pretty, pretty simple things. Um, the way Scala Native gets around that is it includes like um, alternative implementations of some of the JDK classes, but there's definitely not like a, a virtual machine under the hood. Um, instead, everything's basically re-implemented in terms of like C systems calls. Um, and in particular, the really neat stuff Scala Native provides is a set of types and annotations uh, for really, really cool like C interop like tricks. Um, and it really encompasses like the full range of like weird idiomatic C programmer stuff that we all know and love. Um, so like you can do things like this. You declare C struct types, basically like, like tuples, right? So we'll declare a vector type, like it's a three dimensional vector of three doubles. And then we just have this uh, stack alloc um, uh, function that'll just allocate one on the stack and give us back a pointer to it, right? So pointer is, <laughs> is asterisk, right? Um, I actually, I've, I've written C for a long time, and like once I saw this, it's like, it's hard to go back, it actually just makes more sense. 
Um, the kind of weird thing is because it's tuples, you don't have names for your fields yet. That's coming in 0.4 is my current understanding. Um, so you do have to keep track of uh, which field is which. Um, but it's crazy fast and it actually compiles down to real structs uh, with all the, the goodies. Um, same thing goes for arrays, arrays of structs, void pointers, um, it's, it's awesome. Um, the, the other really cool thing is binding to um, C functions, either the standard library or external libraries. You just declare one of these extern objects, uh, you name your, your function, you give it the right type signature, and the value is just extern. And at, um, not at compile time, but at link time, um, Scala Native will look it up and create the, the suitable like dynamic linking stubs um, for all the magic to happen. And then, congratulations, you have malloc and free, and now you can have... <laughs> you could have all of the horrors of segmentation faults in your Scala native programs, win. Um, no, but what this also means is like you could also do something like write a, write a custom memory allocator in Scala, which starts to get really exciting. Um, I will also say Scala native has an excellent um, garbage collector. Um, and if you're running pure Scala code, you don't have to worry about uh, memory allocation or stuff like that. It's only when you go down into the C interop and you're slinging pointers around that you have to deal with that. But that's also where the really fun, powerful stuff is, so you're gonna see me do um, a fair amount of it today. Um, what it does include is it, it, it does include um, implementations of hundreds of JDK classes in, in, in terms of these like basic C libraries. Unfortunately, that's actually like a, a drop of an ocean. The JDK is enormous. Um, there's pretty good, but not entirely complete ANSI C bindings. Um, same for POSIX, the like Unix standard, circa 1983 or whatever. Um, but the, the cool thing is because it's so straightforward to bring in and just add your additional ones, you can, it's e easier to write your own than to use the, the standard ones in many cases. Um, so what can you do with this? What can't you do with this? Obviously you can't do anything that's depending on like deep uh, JVM uh, capabilities. Anything that's using like Netty, for example, uh, like Aka HTTP is probably not gonna be possible in the near future. Um, on the other hand, if you wanna do something that you have a C library for, um, and maybe you don't have a good Java binding, then you're gonna have an awesome time. Um, and that's where I think this gets really exciting. Um, so yeah, let's move into the, the actual like substance of a talk. Like what's a server? Why are, why are servers hard to write? Um, I'm gonna argue that a typical server, like granted that's broad generalization, does like four things. It listens on, a, on, a, on an open port, um, it accepts incoming connections on that port, um, it reads requests, and it writes responses. Um, the, the reason it's hard is because it has to do all of these things at the same time. Um, and that it has to do it with system calls, uh, that we're traditionally um, have, having blocking semantics. Um, that's big, big, big asterisk, right? Um, which we'll get to in the, the second half of the talk. Um, but the, the system calls that actually allow you to do this, right? Because you're, I mean, the great insight of Haskell is your programs don't do I.O. That best your programs can ask a, your, a, your runtime to do I.O. for you, right? Um, the, the system calls that allow a program to, to ask uh, an operating system to start doing stuff on the network are, are here. It's really just about eight of them. Um, but the, the really tricky ones are bind and listen. Um, so you initialize a socket with socket. Uh, you call bind to assign it to a, a given port and address, which is pretty straightforward. Listen is really interesting, though. When you call listen, that's what tells your operating system, hey, this is a server socket. If you get inbound TCP connections on this port and address, it's gonna start um, accepting the three-step TCP handshake, sending acts, and establishing connections. But the thing is, your operating system is doing that for you in the background, totally separate from your program. What happens is it establishes, the, it establishes these connections and puts them in a backlog. And, of course, this backlog has a fixed size. Um, then when your program calls accept, accept isn't the thing that establishes connections. All accept does is it pulls those connections off of the internal backlog, right? And um, there's a lot of Scala people in the room, so I bet a lot of people know about back pressure and knows, hey, if you have like a finite queue and stuff coming into it, the worst thing that can happen is your queue fills up and that's when your server will stop, will start refusing requests entirely. The really critical um, sort of, um, metric I would say for, for servers in general is can it keep up with incoming connections uh, as fast as, as it needs to um, before it starts dropping things on the floor. Um, once you've established this connection, you know, then there's more specialized um, uh, 
system calls like receive and receive message, but you can also just read and write to it like a file. Good old fashioned Unix, everything is a file magic. Um, the one um, like uh, additional asterisk is that there's these three um, IO control, set socket op, and file control um, system calls, and these are like pure evil. Uh, doing this in like a portable and backwards compatible way is why this is hard, and I'm not going into it at all. Um, but just to be aware that this is a, a, a something that I'm totally punting on for this talk. Um, so the, the way these all fit together is like this. So you've got a server and a client. Um, the server sets up the socket by calling socket, bind, listen, and then accept. And then the client, right, is called socket and connect uh, to, to, to establish the connection. And then you just go into a, a loop of, of read and write calls, and then you're done, right? Um, it's relatively straightforward. Typically, the, the examples of this are in like ANSI C textbooks or whatever. Um, this is what it looks like in Scala Native. Um, is that relatively reasonable? Thumbs up, thumbs down? No? Um, is that any better? Okay. Cool. Um, so I'll have to remember to uh, shrink this back down afterwards. Um, so it turns out the hardest part of this is actually allocating the structure to hold addresses. Um, the Berkeley Sockets API predates ANSI C and void pointers by like a year. Um, so instead, there's all of these unsafe casts between um, a couple of different socket variant types because you could have internet sockets, Unix sockets, all these weird like 80s like <laughs> things that don't exist anymore. Um, so there's a, a lot of things that seem pretty foreign to, to us. Um, but the, basically, we just um, we we use malloc. Unlike in C, <coughs> unlike in C, you actually cast malloc a lot because you are in Scala and you aren't just slinging void pointers around with total cavalier um, capabilities. And then when, once we've allocated the socket, we just say, hey, this is an internet socket, so it's it's going to be one of the IP protocols, TCP or UDP. Um, we set up the port, um, and then we set it to uh, any address, which is the same as binding to 0.0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Um, once we have that set up, then we just call socket um, to get a new file descriptor. Um, we're going to say internet socket and sock stream to say we want a TCP socket and not a UDP socket. Um, and then we call bind. We pass in that server address. We cast it down to a more generic form of socket address that doesn't necessarily have the, uh, the, the, the internet socket formats. Um, and then um, we give it the, the size of the address object too. Um, once we do that, we just call listen. We give it the size of the, the, the backlog. Um, and the one other kind of weird thing is we also have to pre-allocate um, a, um, a struct to hold the address of clients as they come in. This is the client address thing um, that's uh, relatively similar. And once we've done that, we can just go into a, like a, a while loop and start calling accept, um, which gives us another file descriptor, right? What's weird is that the server like socket and the actual connection are both file descriptors, but they're actually pretty different. Server sockets you can really just accept on. You can't, it's not meaningful to read or write from them. The connections are the things that are more like a bi-directional pipe um, and, and that you can actually use like a file. So once you have this connection um, down here, then you can just pass it into another method to, to actually handle it. Um, let's see if that code is readable. Um, yeah, it looks okay. Um, so the idea is once you're in there, um, it's actually pretty straightforward. Like we'll just malloc a buffer so we can actually read stuff. But other than that, this is, um, at least syntactically, this is relatively idiomatic Scala. There aren't any crazy types. Granted, while true loops and like returning is not idiomatic Scala at all. But I ported this from a C textbook, be gentle to me. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, but the, the catch is what with this approach, right, what's gonna happen when we have a new connection coming in? Like our main while loop is gonna block most of the time and read inside of this loop, um, but what happens if more accepts come in, right? They'll just go uh, back into the backlog and we could be stuck in that inner while loop um, basically until the client decides to stop sending us stuff. Um, so this is sort of the, the fundamental question is how do you do two things at once? How do you get a program to, to block in two places at once? And the way you do that is with my single favorite Unix system call, fork. Um, fork clones a process in place. It doesn't create a new process, it creates an exact copy of the process that, 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 you, that, that called it. Um, it's, it's sort of magical, like one process calls, two processes return at the same place, but with different values. I, I like to call it a reverse Thunderdome, but I'm ching. 
Um, there's a pretty uh, formal parent-child relationship between the two. Um, the parent is responsible for supervising the children and cleaning them up. If they aren't cleaned up, they become zombie processes. They will clog up your process table. They can take your kernel down and like of your host, not just a container. So like, be careful if you're doing this. Uh, zombies will 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 overwhelm your containers. Be careful. Um, hashtag no zombies. Um, so right with fork, um, I'm gonna zoom this back out. Um, Basically, what fork allows us to do is um, immediately after calling accept, we can fork, and then our parent can go back and block and accept again, and then the child that comes out of the fork um, can go into the read-write loop, and that's uh, like the textbook, like um, Systems 101 way to get a, a working, like concurrent Unix server um, running. Um, <clears throat> um, I can't go super fast or line by line here, but the idea is you call fork. Right, it returns a process ID of what the new process is. But the trick is it only returns that to the parent. The child just gets zero. So by um, switching on the process ID, um, you can know whether you're in the parent and then you can return immediately or if you're in the child and you can do stuff. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, so right, winning, um, <laughs> except not. What are the downsides of this approach? Um, the testing, right? <laughs> Um, testing systems programs are hard. Uh, everything is like dealing with hardware and backwards compatibility and vendors and those wonderful things. Testing concurrent code is also hard, as I think everyone in the room knows. Testing concurrent systems code is probably the hardest thing there, eh, one of the hardest things there is to test. I won't be that sweeping. Um, beyond just like correctness, there's robustness, making code that really works the way you'd want it to in a production situation. People don't just sit down and write perfect like server code. This is something that has to be hardened by running it in production over years, and it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, portability is viciously difficult just because of the number of like backwards compatible hacks um, and quirks, uh, a lot, especially things that either got coded into the POSIX standard or were coded in and then implemented differently by different vendors. BSD versus Linux versus sometimes Unix, um, it gets terrifying. And then <laughs> trying to do that while implementing your application logic in the same code will really wear on your sanity. <laughs> um, so there's, there's any number of good reasons not to do this in your own code, or at least not to maintain it as part of the same package uh, that uh, actually contains your, your application, right? Um, so it's like, what are the techniques we can use to sort of divide this problem of writing a server into parts so that we can either find or uh, improvise some kind of like useful and effective uh, like server socket handler um, and then have all of our application code live somewhere else and um, presumably we'll be doing that with Scala Native, right? Um, the, right, like Unix hackers have been doing this for multiple generations. Uh, um, and the, I think my favorite like uh, expression of the philosophy was, you know, write programs that do one thing, do it well, that work together, and that everything handles text streams. That's um, Peter Salis's, um, uh statement, right? Um, and in particular, I'm going to go further and say that HTTP is a solved problem. Um, Nginx is out there, right? Uh, there's great things like Envoy, um, like Proxygen. Like there's plenty of good tools for doing HTTP well. Um, so the question is, what's the simplest way to get a stable HTTP server for a Scala native app? And like, let's figure out how it performs. Um, and that being said, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna hand wave over this section. I sort of walked through exec, um, which is like what shells use to exec new processes. Um, I don't think I quite have time for it, but it's like what you'd use to implement inetd. The thing that's really important is when you're, um, after you fork, when you exec to create a new process, you can, um, you can do lots of cool tricks with the file descriptors. You can make a single like connected socket look like both the standard input and the standard output of a new, pro of a, of a new program, for example, um, which is one of the like, all-time great, like everything is a file hacks. Um, and it lets you just sort of read, write, print, whatever, um, without having your like, inner program having to know there's a, any, any socket um, or, or like network involved. Um, but I can't go super deep into that. Um, the, the trouble is that's enough to give you like a bare bi-directional um, stream, a connected TCP socket. And a lot of the early internet services didn't need any more than that, like FTP and like R login, SSH, stuff like that. Um, HTTP needs more. It has a request response protocol, like sort of at the L5-ish layer. Um, it has these like resources and other important me metadata like methods and parameters. 
um, and the RFC for it is like 300 pages long, and parsing it isn't easy. Um, when people write efficient HTTP parsers, they tend to get used by a lot of people for a long time, um, and it's also not, not to be underestimated. Um, what we need then for our Scala native um, uh, uh, jam is we need some generic way to handle concurrent HTTP connections. We need to route them to various like uh, programs that implement our logic. And then the simplest request response protocol for handlers uh, that we can get. And da -da -da -da, drum roll, it's Apache um, <laughs> uh, and CGI. Um, so Oh, those, those went out of order. Um, so Apache is um, the direct descendant of the NCSA uh, HTTPD from Urbana-Champagne. It's pre a pre-fork-based web server. Not quite the same as the fork accept model, but um, I'd love to talk about the differences afterwards. Um, may or may not be upon an Apache web server. Uh, they deny it now, but it totally is. Um, the cool thing about CGI, right, is you can write um, CGI handlers in Bash, in Perl, in Awk, or in C, right? It's the most generic like interface you could possibly ask for. All you need is environment variables, uh, standard input, standard output. You don't need an operating system for that. All you need is like, like the, the facilities of ANSI C. And for, for people here who are interested in emerging languages, that's really powerful, right? Um, because those are like pretty much what you can get from version 0.1 of, of any language out there. Um, and it gets, a, it gets a bad rap because people wrote a lot of terrible software in CGI back in the 90s. Um, but it's actually possible to write pretty good software in CGI also. If you like sort of squint at it and turn your head to the, the right a little bit, it almost like resembles serverlessness or like finagle or like everything's a function of streams onto streams. Um, there's actually a lot of cool things going on there if I could spend more time in the hand wavy sections of the talk. Um, so this is, a, this is a program that implements an entirely useful uh, Scala native CGI bin handler. <laughs> That's all it takes. And I've got one running, so. Oh. Bam! Uh, that's, <laughs> you don't have to applaud for that one. <laughs> Save it for the end. Um, so um, actually building that, uh, I have a whole other blog post about this. And again, I'm going to have to go kind of fast. Um, building like small Scala native Docker images is interesting because you need like Scala, Java, SBT to build them, even if the resulting binary is like five megs or something like that. Um, so I'm using multi-stage Docker builds here. So this is where I'm saying, hey, from Scala native base build as build, and then like the second half of the build, same file. I'll start over, but then I can copy things in from the build stage. Um, and because it's, um, it's dynamically linked, right, not statically linked, I have to copy in the exact um, dynamic libraries it links to, which is a little fiddly, um, but it works. And then I can just like add Apache and run it, um, which is pretty cool. And I, I already demoed it and spoiled that part. <laughs> um, but that was like a degenerate, um, like <laughs> that was not really a CGI like thing. Um, if I were to write like to my design, like a like a like a little web program or something like that, I would want something that looks kind of like this. Sort of has that like Flask Sinatra. Hey, let's just do. Let's just like make this as simple as possible, right? Um, the sort of, hey, everything is a method of request onto response. It has a method and a pattern matcher. Maybe we can use Scala pattern matching to pick apart the URL path segments, stuff like that. Um, and implementing this takes like maybe like 60, 70 lines of code. Um, like let's say we have a router trait, um, right? It takes a bunch of handlers and the handlers are all basically just functions of request onto response with a method and a path. Uh, maybe request just lets you get at the method, the, the path. Right, which is the, the path info in CGI is the segment of the URL that comes after the name of the program that's executing. So you can absolutely have like web 2.0 style like rest URLs. You don't have to have question mark line noise. Um, you can totally get like clean URL design in, in, in CGI. And then let's just say the response is a body, a status code, and some headers. Right, then imp to implement this, Really, the only thing we need is standard lib.getinv. I wrap it because I would rather present this to the like end users of the application as a string, like a Scala string with all the nice methods it gets, rather than a C string, which is just an array of bytes, right? So, I, and I've got some null safety and stuff like that. And then, you know, so if I have this path info with a URL, I can just split it on slashes and do some filtering. If I have the query strings, I, you know, those are the question mark, x equals y, you know, a equals b, et cetera. I just sort of do typical Scala kind of messy uh, for comprehensions to split them and group them like this. Um, um, 
um, right, and once I have all that, uh, then actually running it is pretty straightforward. So this is like the implementation of the router trait. Um, I just parse the request. I walk through all my handlers and just try to find the longest match uh, based on the, the, the prefix of the, the path info. Um, and then I run the handler to get the response. And then I print out all the headers uh, with this beautiful colon white space separated uh, form. And then I print out the response and that's it. Um, and so this runs. Um, again, to save time, I'm not gonna live demo this part, um, but this can get a, like a mean response time of 40 milliseconds under light load. Um, the 99th percentile response goes over a second at 150 users, um, and then um, like the mean um, response plateaus around 500 milliseconds at 300 users, can handle a max of about 400 requests per second. Um, I think we all saw the keynote, so I don't have to go too deep into the intricacies of like long tail optimization and stuff like this, which saves me at least like three minutes. Um, so by comparison, like a Python CGI app, um, like just doing Hello World, that takes 136 milliseconds to just return a basic Hello World response. And it does because you're starting a new process over for every single request. And with Python, that's loading a relatively large interpreter and running your code and maybe like uh, compiling it, right? Um, so basically what you get with Scala Native, because it's pre-compiled, because it's like a five meg binary, um, you're getting um, about three times faster response under light load, and you're handling about twice as much load um, before things get sort of dicey. That being said, in absolute terms, um, these aren't actually the, um, the, the best numbers, right? Like, like a trivial Node.js Express app can get a median response back in about seven milliseconds. Um, and um, in the 99th percentile stays under one second up to 2,000 users. Um, the error rate gets up to about 15% around 500 users, which is a little higher than I was expecting, to be honest. Um, but the peak throughput's around 2,000 requests per second. Um, so I guess the rest of the talk, and I have like 15 minutes, which is great, is how can we do better than Apache and CGI? Uh, how can we sort of close that gap with, with Node to get, not like a perfect web framework, because honestly, like most programs don't bottleneck at your middle tier web framework. They're gonna bottleneck somewhere else. Like I'm just aiming for adequacy and like to get to where we can do something useful, right? And without spending years of our lives or like, you know, um, uh, just like 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 slogging away at writing socket code, right? Um, and the, there there's actually two ways we can do this that are pretty pragmatic and are like weekend project, like sort of, sort of level um, undertakings. Um, one is multiplex protocols. Um, so that involves uh, bringing in a proxy server in front of our application um, and using a, 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 pro a protocol that's a little easier to handle than HTTP um, to deal with that. And then the other is by doing multiplexed IO directly, um, much like Node does. Um, so that being said, let's do it. So uh, multiplex protocols are a technique for combining uh, str more than one stream onto one stream. I'll have a diagram in the next slide. Uh, you can do that in analog, right? Uh, there's all kinds of ways to do this, but with, um, with digital data, typically what that means is um, you're, you have something that intercepts multiple upstream connections, and then it breaks them into blocks, like frames, and each frame is basically tagged with an identifier. Um, and because you have these frames of a known size and they all have identifiers, it's pretty easy to reassemble them, put them back together. Um, and it means that when, uh, like if I have an application that's consuming this, I can just consume a single socket like connection, right? I have all these requests coming in and they all are tagged with IDs. I can send back responses that also have identifier tags. And again, the proxy will know how to route them back upstream to wherever they need to go. Um, the two things people uh, have heard of that do this is fast CGI, back from 1996, because people realized classic CGI was a problem pretty quick. Um, the other is HTTP.2, HTTP which is like new and is surprisingly similar than to, to fast CGI um, in a way I think is kind of fascinating. That said, fast CGI is a lot easier to implement, um, so that's what I went with here. Um, so, um, basically what it looks like is this, right? You have a bunch of HTTP clients. Um, they're all speaking HTTP to a web server, and then the web server is speaking fast CGI back and forth to a fast CGI application. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. Um, so what makes it different and better than regular CGI? One is that the, the application is persistent. It sits on this connection and keeps it open and processes as much as it can um, and sends it, sends it all back. You're not taking the hit of starting a new process up for every request. Um, 40 milliseconds to start a new process adds up if you're doing thousands of them. 
um, you get persistent connections. You don't have to do any TCP handshakes over and over again. Um, and you can just keep a pipe open between your server and your, um, your application. Um, and uh, again, because the requests are multiplex, you can handle more of them at the same time. Like if you have like non-blocking logic, you can return them out of order and cool stuff like that. So it's actually really nice for like async protocols. Um, and also the framing and the, the, the explicit like size tags on every like chunk of data turns out to be really nice for handling things efficiently. You don't have to scan through like plain text looking for new lines and colons. Like everything is nice and clean. Um, the one catch is we do need a socket, but like stay with me. There's also some like kind of hall of shame hacks to avoid writing socket code if you really don't want to. <laughs> um, but the trick is you might not need concurrency. If you can, like it's, fast CGI does not guarantee you will only have one socket, but if you can convince your servers to play nice together and get it onto one socket, you can just do blocking IO on a single socket and multiplex all the things. And that turns out to be pretty darn fast. Um, so like at a high level, the, 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 the protocol's like this. You read exactly eight bytes, because that's the header. Um, you get the type of the request, um, the request ID, the length, and there's padding also, uh, because it likes to pad things out to eight byte intervals. Um, and then um, uh, basically you keep pulling those, those frames in until you get um, a standard end frame of length zero. And that's what signals, hey, this is the end of the request. It's time to start writing a response. And then you just do it and write it back out in uh, basically the same format, eight byte headers, um, variable size uh, bodies. Um, so like in Scala Native, the way you parse the header looks kind of like this. Lots of fun uh, bit shifty operators. Um, the one thing that's unfortunate, because we are backwards compatible with Scala, we get to inherit Java's signed byte. Boo. Um, so because of that, I have to do a bitwise and of all my bytes with OXFF to make them unsigned, basically. Um, Scala Native has a, an unsigned byte, and I should probably point this uh, to it, but uh, this is as close you get to, a, to like a bare metal void pointer, and we're stuck with it signed for now. Um, what's cool is that even though it's a pointer byte, um, it actually, you can treat it basically like an array, and again, this is unsafe pointer arithmetic, right? This is not something you necessarily should be doing, but when you're trying to write like high performance netcode, being able to inspect the contents of things without doing copies anywhere actually pays off and can make an enormous differences. Um, so we, we read out the version, uh, we read out the, the record type, um, we got uh, two bytes for the request ID, right? So we read them out separately, and then we add them together. We have the, the most significant byte, we shift it eight bits over to the left, which is the same as multiplying it by two to the eighth, and then add it to the, the least significant byte. Um, same thing for the length and uh, for the padding, right? And that's our record header. And then once we have that, we know how to actually read it, because we know how many bytes to read. Um, the, the thing that gets interesting is inside of the, the like content frames, uh, you can also get cool stuff like variable length encodings of key value pairs. And what's interesting is the length um, uh, indicator itself has a variable length. So in this case, you'll do things like if the top bit of the, of the name length offset uh, is one, um, or no, is zero, it's a one byte length. If it's one, um, every, it's actually a four, it's a four byte length. So if it's, if, it's, if it's not zero, then we take everything but the top bit of the first byte and all the other bytes and, and bit shift them. I, I love this stuff. Um, it, it's kind of scary if you don't do this every day, but what's really cool is once you get it right, it's like 100% right and it just works and that's my favorite kind of code to write. Um, okay, I'm, this is kind of shameful, but um, so everyone uses Netcat, right, for connecting to things. Netcat can listen on sockets too. People don't know this. Um, the ability to listen on a socket and pipe it to a program is typically locked behind a compiler flag called dash D gaping security hole, and it's called that for a really good reason, and it's probably not enabled. Even if it's not enabled, you, don't, you, you can still hack it together by um, using another named pipe as like a relay to get the data um, uh, back where it needs to be, but I'm sort of ashamed of this, so I'm not gonna dwell on it, and there's better ways to do this. Um, but yeah, so um, you can take this. Um, it turns out Nginx, I thought it would be great at handling this. Um, Nginx does not, um, in the free distribution, like to constrain to exactly one fast CGI connection. It has excellent fast CGI support, but if you wanna put a cap on the number of connections, um, that's an Nginx Plus, and I do not have an Nginx Plus subscription. Instead, I just wrote like a 80 line proxy in Golang, because Go has a great um, fast CGI support too. 
And this was good. This got a mean response in four milliseconds, which is somewhat faster than the, that Node Express thing I, I wrote a second ago. Um, the error rate's a little lower at 500 users. Um, the backlog starts overflowing a little sooner. Um, it doesn't quite uh, peak at the same level of, um, of load, um, and it peaks around 1,500 requests per second. So it's a little better under light load, but uh, doesn't quite hold up under heavy load as, as well as, as Node does, basically. Um, but that being said, this is, this is pretty cool, right? Blocking I.O. on a multiplex socket um, turns out to be pretty competitive with, with modern frameworks. And I, I'm, I was somewhat surprised by this. And I think this should be promising to anyone who's working with like emerging tools and platforms and technologies. Um, that being said, I think we can still do better. Um, so multiplexed I.O., right, is the big asterisk I have around blocking system calls. Um, traditionally, this was select and pull, and then there's some OS-specific async I.O. options, um, ePoll, KQ, and the Windows I.O. completion ports, which I really don't know anything about, so even bigger asterisk there. Um, what they all provide is the way to pull the state of many sockets at once. Um, it doesn't magically make like reading happen in the background. It just lets you know exactly which things you need to deal with at, at one time. Um, and the idea is because it just has a set of sockets it can deal with, um, it can pull both your listening sockets that you're going to call accept on, and well, as well as your connection sockets, which you're going to call read and write on at the same time. And it allows you to, to fully dispatch all of that logic in the way you would want. Um, it's, it's, it's weird, though. Um, it, it would be nice if it were really logical, but everything is OS specific, there's all kinds of vendor quirks, um, and uh, writing a cross-platform multiplex IO is very, 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 very hard. Um, it requires use of the, the evil trio of IO control, set socket op, and whatever, um, and it's not especially portable. Um, in theory, it goes about like this. I've only got four minutes, so I'm gonna go a little fast now. Um, basically, you establish your, your set with just the listener socket, and then you keep polling, and every time your listener socket is ready, you'll just call accept to pull something off of it, and then if a uh, connection socket is ready, you'll read from it and write from it. Um, in practice, that's really hard to do, but we don't have to do it. Um, Here's the cool thing, libuv, the Node.js event loop, is a C library that anyone can, can link to, not just Node. Um, it's got excellent cross-platform support, uh, great for single threads or single processes, which is great, because Scala Native doesn't have threads yet. Um, it'll run on ePoll in the back end. Um, it has a sort of famous callback API, kind of like Node.js, but also a lot more restricted. Not least restricted because it's in C, so you have to manage memory, and malloking and freeing across asynchronous callbacks is a little scary, let's be real here. Um, also, their, their icon is a unicorn velociraptor. I love it. Um, so, like, like I said, um, I can't go fa I have to go fast here, but the Scala native is great at just binding like a, an external library and linking to it, at link UV, pretty cool. Um, and doing this in your own program, right? Uh, this doesn't require like access to the library or recompiling anything. Um, you can just build this into your program. So um, the cool thing is I think it handles function pointers really elegantly, especially compared to like C. Like if you ask me to sit down and write the signature of a C program that takes a function pointer as an argument, I swear I could work on it for days and not get it right. Um, and this is so much more readable, honestly. Um, and again, I have to go fast, but the basic idea is you just set up your loop, um, you call your pipe, you create a pipe handle. Um, we're gonna use a Unix socket here, um, uh, just for, just for, for speed. Um, we call listen on it, and then we tell it, hey, every time you listen, call this connect callback. And this connect callback says, hey, every time you get a connection in, um, we'll initialize a new pipe, and then um, we'll just call accept on it. Um, and then once uh, we've accepted it, we can say, hey, uh, every time there's something to read, um, allocate memory with this callback, and then call the read callback. So all the, the meat, this is all like boilerplate, all the meat of it is in the read callback, um, which just looks like this. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this after, but I think I have to keep moving. But basically, you're just parsing out all of those. You're just looping and parsing over fast CGI headers um, and then deciding when to, to respond. Um, how does it run? Let's find out. Um, so I've been using um, Gatling for this. Um, and... <laughs> yeah? How's that? It, that's, is that somewhat better? Okay, so Gatling's a Scala-based load testing tool, um, uses Akka HTTP under the hood, really good at hitting things about as hard as you can. This isn't that hard, this is 500 users and 25,000 requests um, with a one second ramp time, so we'll see how it goes. Um, 
Bam. Um, so that cleared 4,166 uh, requests per second, uh, mean response time of 80, that's kind of weird, um, 56 uh, milliseconds on the median, um, and a nice low error rate of one, that's way under 1%. So cool, right? <laughs> um, uh, for, I, I, I've seen that down at four milliseconds. I think there's some network weirdness here. Um, but if you crank that up to 1,000 users, uh, the mean response goes up maybe to like 140 milliseconds. Um, the error rates are about half of nodes, and you don't get any timeouts. Um, to the extent that it does start dropping connections, it drops them very fast, which is exactly what you want in this kind of case. Ta-da! Um, so, yeah. Um, I, was, I was sort of surprised that this worked um, so well. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Um, so this is the part of the talk where I trail off, which is great because I'm at exactly 40 minutes. Um, but yeah, this make, just working on this for a couple months made me think a lot about, well, what do our languages need to give us? Do we need a giant like Java development kit to get things done? Um, and like, granted, there's going to be some hard things, like try bringing in an XML parser to something like this. But I think those are also surmountable, probably. It makes you think hard about whether HTTP is something that belongs in your app or belongs in your infrastructure. Um, in particular, like if you're running in a modern managed cluster like Kubernetes or something where you have any number of multiple layers of like internal and external proxies going, maybe HTTP is a performance task we're paying and maybe we don't need it anymore. Um, especially now that Docker makes it easy to like bundle Nginx in with a, as an application server uh, for local development. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like things are changing. I feel like uh, there's so many exciting new things happening with this. Um, and I, I hope I've uh, given you some idea of how Scala Native is, is a part of it. And that's the talk. Thank you.